actually young people didn't trust their governments and that governments weren't going to get access to these voices. So, in fact, despite them more than because of them, the partnerships with civil society that the UN constantly wrestles with and says it can't achieve was actually lived in this process. Yeah. They ended up with you know something that they're now waving as a flagship in terms of the way these reports can be done because we had you know 280 focus groups in 44 countries and um so so yes i mean the how is in some ways as important as the what in this exercise i mean it was really clear well i think the what is very much shaped by the how and it's very different to to have people from a different mindset context set of life experiences pontificate about the needs of youth um, yeah. and having that youth voice comes through through youth involvement so I, yeah. I'm interested in those drier aspects because I agree that that's really mm. important um, I wanted to just briefly say a little bit about who I am um, sure. and to give context for the for the conversation um, so most of my experience and I think we share some things in common uh, I've done over the last three or four years uh, in Myanmar, a number of youth-led peace-building projects um, using a, a methodology called systemic action research, which is kind of like um, Interpeace's Track 6 approach, if you're familiar with that. And actually, the yeah. person that came up with this methodology is now working with Interpeace in Mali on the um, on a program there funded by Humanity United. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. But we achieved a lot of experience in that work, um, the marginalization of youth from Myanmar's peace process. They're kind of being doubly disadvantaged because they were losing uh, their education opportunities because of the war. Um, They were disproportionately likely to get caught up in cycles of problematic drug use. Uh, Myanmar is a second biggest producer of of opiates in the world. And they were being conscripted into um, uh, state and non-state armed forces to fight the war. Um, So they're disadvantaged as a consequence of violence, but they're also disadvantaged because it's a highly hierarchical ageist society in which they're not given any voice to speak. Uh, So that's unjust, but it's also a huge lost opportunity because there's so much energy and relative plasticity and ability to take on new ideas, to um, cut across identity lines and do fantastic peace building work. And that's what we found. There are amazing social organizers and in bottom up processes with the right support, they had, they had a huge impact. So I've kind of seen, in your work, a focus on participatory processes, focus on youth support, and an interpeace more broadly, I think, a, a kind of bottom up, bottom up ethos, um, which is very similar to the things that, that I hold dear. Um, I kind of started with the New Zealand government um, and then with the UN, and I've since just moved closer and closer, I guess, to the ground, so through INGOs. Um, and then with working with local civil society organizations. And I left Myanmar about six months ago and came back to New York and kind of put my head back up again into this world and, and, and heard and learned about the sustaining peace uh, agenda and various kind of normative conversations that are happening. And I thought, wow, this is just so disconnected from what we've been doing on the ground. How can I try to understand um, and, and bridge these worlds? Um, so that led me to get in touch with Susan, um, who was already doing the peace building podcast. And I said, look, I want to, I want to learn, I want to engage with people and I want to do it in a way that we can have a, ref- a reflective practice that we can share with people. So she took a punt on me and said, okay, you can co-host and, and do a number of, of episodes. Um, and you were one of the people that came to mind quite quickly because I've been working with Elise Ford. Um, from Humanity United on their Transforming Peacebuilding Initiative, which is funding the Mali work and has funded other things that I've been involved in. And she was at the Quaker UN meeting, I think, last month or the month before. And 
Um, I met her when she was there, and I've been I've been re-emerging with a kind of trying to understand globally peace building, and I've been doing pieces of writing with people like Cedric de Koning, and I don't know if you know Cedric, but he's a great thinker about how the how the multipolarity of the world is changing, how global contexts are shifting, how top-down interventionism doesn't work in the same way, lots of stuff like that, and and thinking about what that means for, for peace building. Uh, but she said that of all the people that she heard talk, you were most on point about some of the issues that we need to grapple with. And she referenced the disillusionment of youth with politics in general. Um, the sense of marginalization, obviously, from, from, from peace processes. Um, but then there was also a phrase, and maybe I read it in the report, or she said it, of, of seeing youth, and I'll get it wrong, but I think the essence was not as seeing youth as beneficiaries, but seeing them as, as participants in peace building. Um, and that res really resonated with me. Um, so I thought, here's a person that I really want to talk to um, because of um, a sense of how the world is shifting, how youth organize in different ways, how our political structures are not really, um, they're not benefiting the population, but they're also not engaging youth in a, in a way that it needs to be engaged. And I'm sure many other ideas that, that you could speak to. That's that's what attracted me to reach out to you. Um, well, I'll respond briefly, but th this is very helpful in terms of um, uh, preparing and thinking about it. I mean, the one thing I should say is that, I mean, in terms of your trajectory, I guess I've almost um, arrived at the same place from uh, an, the, the exactly opposite trajectory, which is that my starting point was as a, as a sort of student activist and student leader in a country that was conflict affected in South Africa in the, in the mid 80s, um, uh, co-founded an organization called the Center for the Study of Violence and Reconciliation, which is very much a sort of local and national NGO, which uh, I ran for 15 years. Um, uh, and it was really only at the end of that period that it started to work more kind of um, regionally and on the continent. Um, and it's it's still around, and st I think they still do some extra extraordinary work. Um, uh, and it was a world in which um, our kind of approach to building durable peace in the wake of the conflict in South Africa was, um, you know, it was an organisation which was just unself consciously interdisciplinary. We had a, uh, a, a, a program on on transformation of policing institutions. We're doing really groundbreaking work in terms of police community relations and transformation issues and criminal justice reform. We had a gender program that was working on, on these issues through a gender lens. We had a youth program that was very much schools based and working with the Department of Education and forging the relation. We had a transitional justice unit that was looking at the, you know, and working on the Truth Commission, uh, a trauma center that was uh, providing clinical services to victims of violence. And you know, in every area, in every dimension of what the organization was was doing what was most important was that we were uh, we're testing and thinking about our ideas through the practice and interface with ordinary communities and people. It was in the in, in the schools with young people. It was uh, clinical services to victims of violence through trauma a trauma centre. It was through building community police relations in community police forums, and using that to trade up to you know uh, what I always used to talk about was. Our, you know, it sounds hierarchical, it wasn't that way, it wasn't meant to be that way, but our ability to speak up was completely contingent on our ability to listen down. Um, or I've changed that, I've talked about listening in and speaking out, because <laughs> the in and out thing is a little better than the up and down thing, but it's, it's you know, it's, it's beside the point, that, that, that's semantics. Um, but it was really striking for me because, um, you know, this was a, this was just like the, integrated lived experience of ordinary people demanded that we engaged with all of these dimensions of people's lives. They were an integrated whole. And suddenly I kind of, in 2005, I moved to New York. I started working for an international NGO at that time as the program head of International Center for Transitional Justice. Um, uh, and suddenly I found myself working in this world that was siloed and segmented and 
issues of governance and democracy and human rights and peace and uh, economic empowerment and development were all somehow segmented and donors funding was segmented and everyone would talk about integrated and holistic worlds but no one could actually do it and it was this tension between the way in which the international actors and the global actors um, uh, crafted a, a policy world in which these things were carved up um, was so completely remote from the lived experience of ordinary people that was so integrated. So I, I kind of went from the local to the global in a way and um, have been wrestling with that and trying to return to the, my roots. And so I, I raised this for two reasons. The one is that in a way I kind of came back to the youth stuff through the appointment in this position. And to be perfectly honest with you, it took me completely by surprise. I was sort of asked to throw my hat in the ring initially as one of the um, advisors to it and then asked would I be willing to um, you know be up as the as, the, as a, the lead author put my name in the hat and just didn't believe for one minute that it, I could possibly end up doing that so I was a little bit taken by surprise when they asked me to do it but I, I came to this issue with a lot you know a, a long background in working with youth back in South Africa and those sorts of things but quite a quite a big gap between that work and other stuff I'd been doing on transitional justice and reconciliation. And um, what I had done in the two years previous to this was run into pieces work on resilience. And that was very much, and I'll send you, you know, I'll send you some links to the interpiece stuff on this because that was very much about saying, asking the question, what makes, what, what makes peace hold? Um, what makes communities peaceful, especially where they're surrounded by violence? Can we understand how some communities are insulated from that or how some societies um, recover from it? And the resilience stuff was very strong in the area of disaster recovery and humanitarian uh, aid. The, our, our work on that starts off by completely saying we need to completely differentiate how we think about resilience, but it was very much about uh, understanding peace by recognizing the endogenous resourcefulness, creativity, innovation, the tools that yeah, that ordinary people use in order to craft, build, and sustain peace and circumnavigate the risks of violence, where it's actually a tiny majority, uh, a tiny minority of people who are involved in violence in the vast majority. So this resonates very strongly on the youth stuff because it was very much me saying, okay, we need to look at this through a resilience lens and the what attracted me and why I think I could find a space doing this on the progress study was that the mandate was to look at the positive attributes of young people and their contribution to peace. And that gave us a route around what I identify as the policy panic and the, and the stereotypes around victims and perpetrators and the entire discourse that corrals young people into a problem to be solved rather than this unbelievable societal attribute and I described the study as an exercise in discovering what young people are doing because no one's listening and no one's looking. And the innovation and creativity of it. Uh, I'm saying this just because, you know, the, the youth stuff is one manifestation of this and one very creative and important one. And I'm very happy for that to be the sort of focal point of our interview. But it is tied to a much longer history, which is an understanding of how damaging, you know, Young people live their lives in these um, seamless and un unsegmented ways, and yet the world is the the, the peace building world is organised and and the well not just peace building but in this sort of um, uh, bifurcated siloed process. The UN is so struggling with that, and so this was quite an interesting way of putting on the table a kind of an approach to building peace with young people at the at its centre that challenges all of the UN silos, all of the kind of turf battles, all of those sorts of things. And at the same time threw up um, sort of what we've, what we've called a typology of youth peace building. I mean, that makes it sound much more sophisticated than it is. It's not a typology. It's just an illustration that's organized under a certain category, but in which this ridiculous creative drive of young people, you know, and that's what I was, you know, that's the, the challenge for me in what I was saying in that meeting in CUNA was a bunch of peace builders really looking back and saying, what's the heart of this? How have we done this? What worked and what didn't? And me asking the question, are we even thinking about 
a new and changing world and what will work and why young people can drive that and how they challenge our assumptions and our thinking and how they are, you know, they, we keep on talking about including them and inviting them to the table. And they say, we don't want to be invited to your table. We've set our own and look at what we're doing with social media and the spaces we're occupying and the ways in which we're driving conversations and the, the change in our lives that, you know, youth used to be about the boundaries of turf and gangs and, you know, the neighborhood and suddenly on your cell phone, you can, the horizons of what young people can see and their experience of horizontal inequality is global. They look at, they see the whole world. Yeah. Wow. Um, there's so much there that resonates. Um, I, I think I have a number of very similar views. I, I have a, I have a, a lot of skepticism that the, future of peace building or the innovation is peace in peace building to what we need it to be to be more effective in terms of durable peace is going to come through the institutions that were set up after the second world war or to not be too um laying too much blame at those institutions the processes of of organizing um and this top-down establishment of silos as you as you described it i don't think the answers are within those i think they're they're not just across those they're outside the whole system um yeah and i'm when you talked about youth the the difference between allowing youth to be at the table which is a power a statement of power um, yes. versus youth saying we don't agree with your table we don't think it's legitimate or it's working and we see a new way and it's not actually a table. Um, no. Those metaphors don't apply. I think yeah, that yeah, yeah. you're absolutely right. And I don't think that we need to focus this report around this podcast around your re report at all. Um, mm -hmm. We can, uh, if you want to, but there's other, other, when what you mentioned, there's a lot that I see is extremely valuable on the interconnection of, of um, peace building issues or what you called a integrated lived experience at a community level. That's what we see. I mean, that's what everybody sees in conflict affected settings that um, if you ask somebody what peace means to them, and that's a fantastic question, they're not going to say, okay, strengthening of rule of law institutions and, you know, all of those things that apparently are the toolbox or thematic domain of peace building, they're going to say all the consequences of, of, of violence, like I can't send, I can't tend my crops all the time because I keep on getting displaced or I can't send my kids to school or, you know, we have their economic migrants or whatever, you know. And so we would do the systems mapping at a community level. And it would, it's really interesting because it just gets all of the problems and solutions onto a wall and how they're connected. And it's incredibly complicated for everybody involved and confusing. But within that, they see connections to improve their lived experience of peace. And for me, that's, that's a definition of peace building that we don't pay enough attention to is what the people that are actually experiencing conflict, how can their lives be improved through their own agency, through, as you said, their own ingenuity, creativity, resources, with some support from, from outside. So that kind of resilience framing that you mentioned that cuts across these silos, I think is fascinating. We've found that we're, that work hard to get funded because we say this is building peace. It's making communities more resilient in the midst of conflict to have better outcomes in their lives. But people say, well, where's the dialogue component? Or, you know, but they're not working with that other ethnic group. They're only working within their own ethnic group. It can't be peace building. And that's, for me, that's a problem of all of our thinking being framed from the top by people that probably, most, for the most part, haven't experienced conflict before. Um, so I find that idea that you mentioned fascinating to unpack as well. Um, so in terms of you know where this where this leads us, and um, I should explain to you the kind of flow of the podcast and how it goes, and then we need to arrive at you know what we think we should actually talk about. Um, so what typically happens, and and I mentioned that it's a 
um, it's a pretty personal approach. By that, I just mean that, hang on, let me do something here. That what I do um, for a start is that I would ask you, I'd mention, mention how we um, got to know each other. So I'd probably say something along the lines of a mutual um, acquaintance. I wouldn't say too much because we don't know each other that well. Yeah. So I'd keep that pretty bit brief. But then I'd offer you the chance or invite you to talk a little bit about yourself. And that's mostly a personal kind of what you've reflected now, how you got into it. And yeah. we go as, as by personal, I just mean that it's not, we're not looking for the, um, the kind of resume as much as what was, what was the drive? Uh, what was the, you know, for some people, it's just a complete intolerance of injustice, um, whatever it might be. That yeah. story about how you got into it and you, and you kind of trace that pretty well the from the ground to the 30,000 foot but trying to hold that um hold that that theme and that feeling with you then the third part that we get into is what we call sharing a story and that's kind of the the meat of our conversation um whether it was framed around the youth peace and security report or whether it's framed around these other topics that we think is important we go through uh, a conversation that conversation is mostly you talking um, and populating um, points that we've kind of roughly agreed on that we're going to discuss with some stories from your experience or from um, from the world from the world of peace building and then we close it out with um, Susan calls it closing inspiration and guidance um, it might be a number of different things it might be I think what would be very valuable for for this, given what we've talked about, is a vision for the future that is, um, I don't want you to pretend that you're the voice of youth, but maybe what the youth have told you. Well, what they, what we heard. Yeah. From them. You know, I mean, it's the, it's the, it's the, it's smartly using the most quotable quotes about what, some of the most striking things I heard in the process that just you know, define a path for us that if we're listening carefully. <laughs> yeah. I'm comfortable with that. Okay. Okay. And, and this is all out, uh, outlined in the, the original invitation that I sent you, which I, I went through it. I looked at it and, and I think the guidance on preparing is very helpful because otherwise I'm long winded and I think that will help me focus on those categories and the timelines associated with each. And that's useful. Okay, and I mean, what I would do in addition is to give that that structure some some um, uh, more contour or or content is kind of agree with you now. Okay, yeah. what what is the um, the four to five points that are are going to shape this conversation? Personally, I was fascinated by what you said about. Um, coming out of uh, the integrated experience of people on the ground and then coming into moving into more of a policy world and seeing that siloing um, then the resilience piece that into peace has done the conversation about youth not wanting to be it the things that I reflected back they really mm -hmm. resonated to me um, and there, there could be more in that vein I feel like we um, we share a lot of, of common kind of, I don't know if it's ideologically or values based or whatever. Um, or it could be alternatively, it could be um, you feel a need um, to use this vehicle to bring the voice of youth out of that report and yeah. target, um, target a, a different audience um, with an approach that allows you to not be limited by some of the political yeah. considerations. Um, so they're yeah. quite different. Um, I, I don't know that I see them as mutually exclusive. I mean, in as much as um, I think the first sort of um, the first couple of things that you you mentioned are are in a way about framing the kind of why this matters. I mean, so so firstly, I would quite like to 
I think it's helpful to focus on the youth thing. I think it's the most recent work I've done, and I think that it's very tangible and very focused. Um, I think it's important that, you know, one of the reasons why I was explaining why I kind of came to this out of a broader set of engagements, which are about, you know, uh, justice and trauma and, you know, the, and the integrated sort of lived experience of ordinary people is because um, I don't think of myself as a, an expert on youth. Um, I think the only experts on youth are young people in, in many respects. But um, so, so I'm very, I'm very comfortable with those kind of uh, signposts that you identified. I think there's one, there's one part of this, and this is not about wanting to market the study. It's not about using the podcast to profile it. It's more about um, the kernel of what we discovered mm. being, you know, finding a place to describe it. Because, you know, what you said about worrying about the way in which sustaining peace seems so abstracted. Mm. I had a slightly different experience of it. I suppose it's because I was um, investing a positive uh, set of associations in the sustaining peace rather than looking at it as a, as a screwed up policy process that is mired in the, you know, interagency battles and the, you know, the, the current, current sort of UN context. Um, but what was most striking for me was the way young people described, often without calling themselves peace builders, mm. the way they described their peace building. Um, and they described a process, you know, it's in that typology. They described a process in which peace building was not about one phase. It wasn't about post-conflict exercises. It was across this entire peace and conflict spectrum where the early intervention models that they were talking about were truly preventive at the front end, right through to a prevention approach, which was saying, how do we recover from this to prevent recurrence? And they went even further than the standard sustaining peace language. You know, the sustaining peace language what was important about it was the shift it forced on the UN to say sustaining peace is about preventing the um, the outbreak, the uh, the continuation, the escalation, and the recurrence of conflict. Well, that was good because we'd only ever been talking about the recurrence, the post-conflict peace building, etc. Young people even added to that. They said, well, actually, it's also about the way in which patterns of conflict and violence transmute. We keep on thinking we just... We're looking at the same thing, you know, playing itself out again, but actually the lines between gender-based violence, criminal violence, political violence, extremism and terrorism, but these are fungible categories for, you know, and they watch young people move between these underworlds um, or, or creatively resist being drawn into them in different ways. And so there's the segmentation, even in the way we think about conflict in narrow terms, that they, they give the lie to it. And they do it in in their practice. This is not a conceptual or a policy conversation. It's we work across all these phases. We work across all of these typologies of violence. Yeah. Um, young people in the Caribbean saying to us, if you talk about violent extremism, you completely exclude us. It's not our issue. It's not the way that describes our lived experience of gangs and drugs and you know other things that are the source of conflict for us. Um, uh, young indigenous women in, in Guatemala were saying the same thing, but describing the violence and the conflict to which they're exposed and the resilience in which they're dealing with it differently. And we try and aggregate all this stuff because it's convenient for us at a policy level. And they're doing exactly the opposite. Um, the, the, the way they describe working at different levels. I mean, some young people are talking about global networks. They feel that through their networks globally, they, they drove, uh, Security Council Resolution 2250, they moved the international community at a policy level, but other young people are talking about family, the most local, the most intimate relationship building, people to people stuff, and sometimes, you know, much more kind of innovative partnerships. Um, they were saying, you know, young, two young people in Libya saying to me, we don't have a central state we can partner. But boy, are we getting good at finding mayors, local mayors who create the space. And then we crochet connections between these local contexts. And we're bringing the mayors together. And we're driving the kind of exercise of crocheting peace. So the one thing I want to do is find a space mm. describing this. As I say, not because it's about marketing the study. It's not about a PR exercise. It's yeah. because it's the kernel of what young people 
are showing us about learning through doing, the doing that they, that, you know, they invented sustaining peace. <laughs> they, 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 they've been doing it. It's not like this, you know, and we act as if we discovered this at the, at the UN and in these policy spaces. So that's kind of, you know, because it gives a, text, a, a sort of tactile feel to, you know, there's so much of the local ownership, bottom up. It's a, I, I want to kind of find a way of describing it that is in their lived experience, everyday practice, that they don't even call peace building. Mm -hmm. I love it. I, I absolutely love it. I, I mean, it's, it's speaking the language that I think that, we've experienced as well this this idea that these are these are fictions this idea of yeah. conflict peace building preventative in a in a real conflict context there's been ruptures up and down and transmutation as you talk about for most of these people's lives it's just been suffering and and conflict of a conflict type in different forms and the idea that we have instruments that function at this time is just it's more convenient for us um, to yeah. organize our, our funding instruments and everything else than it is for the people that we're actually supposedly working with and serving. Yeah. I have to run now. Um, there's sure. And just, just to say, I think that what I've just described to you is also where this comes out. If you want the kind of inspirational messaging, it's in, it's in the recognition of and the uh, potential for... I don't know what the word is because I don't want to use harnessing because it sounds like we are doing something to it rather than it being on it, you know, but it's about our ability to recognize this. That is the inspirational opportunity going forward that changes the way we think about peace building and change, you know, is much more responsive to changing context and the things we began talking about. Mm -hmm. Channeling. I don't know. All of these mm -hmm. words have yeah. been overused. Graham, it's, it's a real pleasure to, to meet you. I, I, I felt um, a little bit uh, like a little bit of therapy in some of the things that you're saying because you kind of like uh, resonated with some of my frustrations and conversations that I've had with people that didn't, didn't seem to get it, but I think we've just seen similar things. So I really enjoyed that and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Likewise, and maybe we should, you know, treat the, the, the podcast as the first step in an ongoing conversation that we have, if that's the case. That would be wonderful. Yeah. Okay, nice to talk. Okay, to you. brilliant, you too. I'll be in touch by email. Okay, thanks a lot. Bye for now. Ciao.